Good morning all. Glad to see you all could make it here again this early in the morning. Uh, we have um, quite an agenda here today. I'm starting you off, so I, I guess I'm the starter program. And talking about halt who goes there, are you friend or foe? And when it comes right down to it, we have a multitude of different arthropod type organisms that do us a lot of service in the fields in terms of managing other insect populations if we don't accidentally destroy them in the process before we get there. Uh, so we'll start out with beneficial arthropods um, and what they belong to, what they are. Um, that you can see there's a whole list of things there. Insects at the top of the list. Of course, there's tons of different insects that eat other insects. Um, then we also can't ignore the spiders. There are predatory mites. And then we get into the microscopic world where there are bacteria, viruses, fungi, and nematodes that also do their job in managing other insect populations in the field. And so there's a lot of allies out there that are working in our favor to help suppress different populations of pestilent types of insects and arthropods. Um, but there are some nuances there that we have to realize when we're dealing with these beneficial organisms. So what are the beneficial insects or spiders or mites? And just looking at some of the roles that they play, one of the beneficial activities is being a pollinator. And I had a pollinator presentation yesterday, so I'm not going to go into details about that one um, here to this morning. But pollinating different vegetable crops, fruit crops, etc., is a major role that a lot of insects perform. There are insects, spiders, mites that eat the harmful insects. Now, the thing that we have to remember here is these organisms are eating insects that are simply available to them. Do they know that they are harmful insects to us? Absolutely not. They are just doing what nature does, and it just happens to benefit us as they are performing these types of activities. We call them the good guys or the, the ones that wear the white hats. Um, we can call them biological control agents. Um, they fall into categories of predators, parasitoids, and parasites. And so um, that's kind of the definition of their activities and how they perform this beneficial action for us. And we'll look at different types of predators and parasitoids and exactly what a par parasitoid is, and then the parasites. When we talk about parasites, then we're talking about things like bacteria, viruses, uh, and fungi and nematodes that can destroy the other insects. They are incredibly useful at suppressing pest species population. And I have to emphasize that suppressing uh, because a good parasite, a good parasitoid, a good predator is not going to eradicate a population. In fact, that is the last thing that we can afford them to do because if they eradicate their food resource, they are eradicating themselves at the same time. So a good beneficial organism is going, going to suppress. It is not going to eradicate. Uh, and so one of the mindsets that we have to develop in our own minds dealing with these biological control agents is that you will have to accept some level of a pest population being present because they can't completely eradicate that population. Your, our hope is that they hold that population below a threshold that we can tolerate. And so we have to get away from the idea that it's going to be an, a, a total eradication of those organisms that we think are harmful or appear to be harmful to us. They are biological organisms just like the harmful organisms and just like the crop plants that we are trying to grow. And as biological organisms, they are going to absolutely have requirements for growth, development, and survival themselves. So there's going to be an optimum range out there for these organisms to survive and survive well in. And if we don't 
protect that environment or provide that environment for them to survive in, they aren't going to be around very long. And so we have to keep that in mind. What are we doing that could potentially damage these populations? So that means if you want these predators, parasites, and parasitoids working for you uh, in your farming practices or the environment around your farms, you have to understand and know what their requirements are so that you can not destroy them or you can augment them to get them to stay around and survive well. Um, they do, unfortunately, and I say this in, with quotes around, require somewhat of a stable environment. And unfortunately, in agriculture, our agricultural environments tend to be unstable. And we'll look at that stability issue here in a second as to what I mean by that. Uh, so we're wanting something to develop in a somewhat unstable environment. And we'll, uh, again, come back to that. Um, they don't always work in our best interests. Now, again, these are biological organisms doing what biological organisms do to survive. And they don't have a, a booklet out there saying, okay, um, that's an aphid. I can eat the aphids. I'll leave, leave the, the butterflies alone or I'll leave those pollinators alone. Um, they don't have our agenda in mind. They have their agenda and I don't want to use the term in mind because they're not thinking about it. This is simply behavioral. They're doing what nature does. And um, we have to accept that it isn't always exactly what they expect them to do. They can be very opportunistic, meaning that they might start feeding on a pest organism that we're concerned about. But as that population diminishes, there's not going to be enough of them, the past around, to keep them interested. And they'll switch to something else that may not be of any significance to us. But they're opportunistic. They're going to take advantage of the greatest resource that's available to us. Um, so, again, they don't know what we want. We just hope they do what we need them to do. And we've got to uh, realize that uh, they were going to switch hit on us on occasion. Um, and when resources run out or get too low, um, one of their behaviors is going to be redistribute, go someplace else. That's one of the, the beauties of the insects is they have wings. And when they have those wings, they get up and fly away. Now, that's only the adults. Only adult insects possess wings, but the immatures, they're stuck where they are until they reach that adult stage. So the, the larval stages sometimes are better for us than the adult stages because they are stuck where they're at, and they must search very diligently to meet their needs right where they are at. Uh, and so they can be sometimes better allies for us. Again, as a biological organisms, we need to protect them. We need to be careful with what we are doing, that we don't decimate them accidentally. And we also need to provide them with potential alternative resources. Now, as, as a predator, as a parasitoid, um, the larvae frequently are um, very you know, focused on the prey species that they're going to be working on. But as the adult organism, they may have different requirements than the larvae. Then one of those things is an alternative food resource. And many of them, especially the parasitoids, which tend to be tiny wasps and flies, as adult insects, they need very high energy rich food sources which means pollen and nectar. So if you want to encourage a lot of these parasitoids and parasites to stay in a particular area and survive well, you may have to have patches of blooming plants around the farm so that they have these nectar sources, these very rich, high energy sources to keep them alive and keep them active. 
And so that's a, 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 a different crop that you may have to incorporate in your overall practices to encourage and to sustain the, these uh, adult organisms so that when the pest uh, prey comes into play, they are still in the area and can find those prey and be able to take care of them. Uh, so you may have to plant um, yarrow or you may have to plant um, some other blooming plants and not just one that blooms in a week's time and it's done. You may have to have a diversity of blooming plants available for these beneficial organisms to feed on and survive on when the prey species is not present for them. Um, and so there's all kinds of resources that tell you what kind of flowering plants can be very useful throughout the entire growing season from early spring to well into the fall period to encourage and help these beneficial organisms survive for periods of time. Now in a gardening situation in the backyard or in a park or someplace like that, um, you can see that there can be a lot of different flowering plants made available in those scenarios. Um, and diversity, diversity, diversity is the key. The more different types of plants you have and the more different blooming times you have, the more you're going to benefit these other organisms. Even some of the predator species uh, will need flowering plants for nectar and energy on a regular basis. Um, so there's all kinds of plants available. Cosmos is an easy one to plant. Um, some of the perennial plants like echinacea, um, uh, some of the coneflower plants, um, even trees that bloom through the season can be very valuable to the uh, beneficial organisms to keep them alive. So the more diversity that's available to them, the greater the bloom spectrum that's available to them, the more you're going to benefit these organisms to keep them alive and keep them around. Now grasses, unfortunately, really don't have a lot of resources available to most of these insects. Um, they're wind-pollinated plants. Um, they don't have a lot of color to them to attract the different predators and parasitoids in. But even with the grasses, some insects can find them when they're in bloom and utilize them, such as the uh, images up here, those tiny insects that are flying around. Now, that's an, a fly. It is a true fly, not a pun. It is a fly that is called a surfid fly or a hoverfly. And these surfid or hoverflies, um, as adults, are bee mimics. And so they kind of look like little bees floating around these flowers all the time. But their immature stage is a maggot. It is a fly. It's a maggot. But it's an unusual maggot because it is a dry maggot. And then as a dry maggot, it lives on the surfaces of plant leaves and is a major predator of aphid species and scale insect species. Uh, and you know, a lot of people complain about them because they tend to be a little too friendly. They don't know personal space. Then they like to hover around you. They like to land on your skin. They like to pat around on it. And they, since they look a little bit like a sweat bee, it does cause panic in some people. Uh, and they try to kill them because they don't realize what kind of insect that they are. So again, we have to protect the environment that these beneficial organisms live in. We have to provide them with alternative foods. Um, we have to accept that some pest species levels will have to be present uh, because uh, they, if the pest species isn't present, they're going to get up and go away. Um, we also have to understand that they don't always selectively go just for the ones that we're concerned with. Um, they will utilize whatever is available to them. Uh, and the last thing in that column is there, we have to be careful about how much insecticide we might use in that overall spectrum because they are insects to a large part. And if we're um, cavalierly using insecticides, we could wipe out these populations just as easily as some of the, the pestilent species out there. Now notice I used the word there, pesticide. 
Um, pesticide is the broad spectrum term that covers all substances that claim that they kill something. That includes herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, molluscicides, rodenticides, and the list goes on and on. And I use the term pesticide in this particular slide because even some of the fungicides have insecticidal activity to them. Um, and indirectly, herbicides can impact our beneficial insect populations as well. Now, how can that be? It's not a direct killing, but it's an indirect reduction of resources because these beneficial organisms need flowering plants. And a lot of times, the flowering plants that are available to them are the weed species. And if we come in and use an herbicide and wipe out all those weed species that are flowering, we have just eliminated a food resource to those beneficial insects. Um, so not I'm saying to leave weeds grow out through your entire field, but consider the field edges and the lanes and the grass waterways. Now, what type of quote-unquote weed species could be allowed to grow there because they are a flowering resource for your beneficial insects to utilize? Um, and so um, the, um, we have to be uh, cognizant that some of these weeds may actually be helping us when they're not in our agricultural field directly. And uh, additionally to that, we have to be concerned about drifting of insecticides. Obviously, according to Ohio law, pesticide law, it is illegal to allow drifting to occur. You know, we should be aware of that first off the bat. But if drifting of an insecticide occurs from the field where it's being applied to that area where these weeds may be blooming, um, then you have a drifted insecticide on those flowering plants that the uh, uh, beneficial insects have been attracted to. Uh, so we have, have to keep that in mind as well. Um, beneficials would uh, sometimes arrive before your, your pest species are present. Um, so we sometimes have a, an offset between when the pests are there and when the beneficial uh, in, insects are present there. So there can be lag times between when a pest shows up and when that beneficial organism shows up to feed on it and deal with it. Uh, so it, it's not a perfect system. Uh, we have to understand that there are lag periods between prey and predator in the fields. Uh, not every um, beneficial insect is a specialist. Uh, they um, will utilize whatever is present there, especially the predators. And one of the big groups of predators that is very common in just about every agricultural field out there are the beetles called ground beetles. And there are a multitude of species of ground beetles out there, and they are not specialists for the most part. Yeah, there's a couple of species that specialize on slugs and snails, uh, but for the most part, the ground beetles are generalist predators, and they will utilize whatever is available to them at the time, both as adult insects as well as uh, immature insects. And I, I can walk into any agricultural field, move some residue aside, and I can almost guarantee you I'm going to find ground beetles underneath that residue. Uh, typically black beetles, fairly sizable beetles, a half inch to a three quarter of an inch in length, um, and very, very common. They are a major ally to us out there in our agricultural fields. And they are there from the beginning of the season to the end of the season with the multitude of species that are available to us. Um, but again, they're going to switch fr from one species to another as far as prey, based on which is going to be most abundant at the time. Um, being ground beetles, they are associated with the soil, um, and a lot of our caterpillar pests that are of, uh, of associated with our field crops tend to, uh, at some point, end up on the soil surface, and so they do wipe out a lot of caterpillars. Um, now, do they wipe them out fast enough to prevent any injury to our crops? Unfortunately not. 
Um, but uh, if you wiped out those uh, ground beetles entirely out of your field, you're going to have much greater problems with caterpillars than if you did not wipe out these populations. Uh, here on this particular slide, you see a stink bug. Now, this stink bug actually is a beneficial insect. It's called the spine soldier bug. And unlike most of the other stink bugs, which are plant feeders, the spine soldier bug is a predator. And as a predator, both as a nymph as well as an adult, it feeds on a multitude of other insects to go through its growth and development. Now, notice um, this one has something on its beak. And what it has on its beak there is a larval lady beetle. And of course, lady beetles are beneficial insects. And so here's one beneficial eating another beneficial. They're not selective. Now, they'll eat what is opportunistically available to them. They don't know what we want them to do all the time. So we, we've got to keep that in mind. Um, susceptible to environmental disturbances. I, I told you I'd come back to this. And in agriculture, agricultural fields are disturbed environments um, because we're doing all kinds of activities in those fields, and one of them is harvesting. And when you harvest that field, it is a major disturbance to that environment. And if you don't have an alternative environment for the beneficials to retreat to, um, you may lose that particular population. Um, and some, what are additional disturbances in there besides harvesting? Um, monocropping systems. You know, if you only have one species of plant growing in that field, it may not support the entire spectrum of predators and pests um, that these two work with one another. Uh, and so this is where it comes into uh, cover crops. This is where it comes into uh, inner cropping of two different crops or uh, uh, double cropping through the season, increasing that diversity in that field to help protect and support those beneficial organisms. Uh, so it is limited plant diversity and most of the time through most of the year for our agricultural crop environments except for when we have our cover crop opportunities available to us. And if you're using just one type of cover crop like cereal rye, well that may not completely support your beneficial populations. But when you're using mixtures, when you have radishes and grasses and uh, clovers all mixed together in that cover crop um, uh, material that you're using, um, you may have greater, well you do have greater diversity that will help support these beneficial insects better. Now cultivation and plowing, all those different beneficial insects that are associated with the soil surface, that is a very disruptive activity for them. Um, so if you're doing no-till, you've eliminated most of that disturbance. But even uh, con conservation tillage, where you're saving some residue on the surface of the ground and doing some level of disturbance to that soil, you are potentially threatening some of the populations of beneficial insects in there. And then again, those pesticides that I mentioned earlier, insecticides or direct injury, some of the fungicides, and this is the amazing part, some fungicides that we use to control diseases of the plants were initially being developed as insecticides. But in that research process and development of those fungicides, it turned out that they were better fungicides than insecticides, but they still have that insecticidal quality to them. So um, whenever we're practicing those um, just-in-case sprays of fungicides on our soybeans or on our corn uh, to potentially reduce a, a fungal infection, if it is or isn't there, we could also be damaging these beneficial insect populations. Um, so that needs to be taken into consideration. And I already talked about the herbicides in terms of um, that indirect impact by wiping out the alternative food sources 
outside of the agricultural field. Again, I'm not encouraging allowing weeds to grow in the crops, but at the edges of fields and lanes and grass waterways um, where they're not nearly as significant as long as they're not producing massive seed uh, reservoirs to blow into the fields, we should consider leaving some of those at least for a period of time. Um, there are numerous different types of beneficial organisms and they fall into basically four main orders of insects. And so we have the coleopterans, there's lots of predaceous beetles out there. Ground beetles are just one of them. Um, there are tiger beetles, there are um, um, the, the, the carabid beetles, which are the ground beetles, but uh, the lady beetles, the coccinellids, so there's numerous, numerous beetles. The hymenopterans, now, the bees are basically the pollinators, but the wasps are the, the parasitoids. Those are the ones that utilize other insects to rear their young inside of them. Um, the flies, the dipterans, there are a lot of parasitoid flies out there where they lay their eggs on other insects for their, their maggots to utilize the other insect as a food source. The hemipterans, the true bugs, um, there are a multitude of true bugs besides that spine soldier bug. There are damsel bugs, there are big eyed bugs, um, just to name a couple of the other uh, true bugs that are predators. Uh, and then there's a few scattered other orders such as earwigs. Now, anybody know what an earwig is? Uh, earwig is a funny looking insect and it, it tends to be around gardens and around homes quite a bit. Um, and we kind of consider them pestilent because they build up into huge populations there. But it turns out they are also opportunistic predators. And they eat a lot of other insect eggs and slug and snail eggs that are associated with the soil. So they actually have beneficial qualities to them. Praying mantid. Who thinks a praying mantid is a beneficial insect? Yeah, yeah, we have an opportunistic one up here. Um, the praying mantid, um, it, it's got a reputation of being this um, governmentally protected predator out there in the field. Well, unfortunately to me, its value is dubious. And there's a number of reasons behind that. Uh, one has to do with its first meal as its brother or sister as they're hatching out of the egg mass. And so they are cannibalistic, and at being cannibalistic, they have to start giving one another a wide berth very quickly after they hatch out of the egg mass. And that disperses them very widely to the point that they have very minimal impact on overall pest populations. And as was mentioned up here, they are incredibly opportunistic. They will eat whatever flies in front of their face and they can capture. Um, so here we see a praying mantid that's eating a yellow jacket. Well, great. You know, yellow jackets are nasty little um, uh, wasps that will be very aggressive and sting you if you happen to come into their colony somewhere. Um, but here you see a praying mantid eating a bumblebee. And bumblebees are fantastic pollinators. It shouldn't be eating that bumblebee. That helps us. Eh, again, they don't know what our agenda is. Um, here is a praying mantid eating a wheel bug, and a wheel bug is a major predator as well. Um, and here's one eating a monarch butterfly. Oh, monarch butterflies, keep your hands off of them. Uh, but uh, it flew in front of the face of the praying mantid, and it took advantage of that. And here's one that actually caught a hummingbird and is consuming the hummingbird. Now, this is a big insect. Now, this is not a typical event, so don't start killing the praying mantids because they're eating a hummingbird. Uh, but uh, it flew in close enough in front of the face of this big praying mantid that it was able to capture it and kill it. Um, not an everyday event, but somebody actually managed to capture a picture of that. And of course, there's also that reputation of one mate eating the other when it gets a little too close. Uh, and this can even happen in the process of copulation. While the male is mating the female, she reaches back and grabs him and chews his head off. And apparently, that helps copulation. He has no reserves after that. Um, <laughs> 
And then we get into situations like this. <laughs> can't get away with anything, can you? But um, so, uh, not every beneficial insect is as beneficial as we've been led to believe over time. Um, and some are better than others. Um, and it depends on the stage that that particular beneficial in insect is in as to what it's doing out there in the field. I'm hearing crickets. You know, somebody fall asleep already? But uh, we have to remember they, they change through life. Now, the vast majority of our insect beneficials start out as an egg. And I say that the vast majority, some uh, give live birth, but not many. Uh, and they fall into categories of incomplete metamorphic or complete metamorphic. And so it depends on what order of insect that you're looking at. So we have egg, nymph, and adult for incomplete, egg, larva, pupa, and adult for the complete metamorphic. And these different stages can potentially be vulnerable at different times of its lives if you don't know what they're doing at those different stages recognizing these beneficial insects at their different stages is important um, because if you don't recognize it you might destroy it accidentally because you don't know who they are so here we have two different examples of eggs of beneficial insects anybody know what those eggs belong to oh, somebody said that one is a green lacewing oh was that you Rory <laughs> Uh, yeah, the one is a green lacewing, and that's the one that's on those tall silken stalks. And uh, they lay their eggs on those stalks because the larvae of the green lacewing are opportunistic. And the first one hatched out would eat the other eggs before they hatched out if they were all laid on the surface of the leaf together. Um, then the other cluster of eggs there, that is a cluster of lady beetle eggs. And so if you don't recognize those eggs, you might accidentally destroy them. Um, continuing on with that same scenario, the insect on the left-hand side is the larval stage of the green lacewing. It looks nothing like the adult it's going to become later on in life, but it's very recognizable by those sickle-shaped jaws that they possess. Um, very unusual, and unfortunately, if you get one of these green lacewing larvae on you, it will taste you to see if you happen to be edible as well. And when those sickle-shaped jaws enter your skin, it will give you a little bit of a sting. Um, so you know, you've got to be aware that uh, they will taste anything to see if it's edible or not. And then the one on the right-hand side, that is the larval stage of a lady beetle. That little lizard-looking um, type of insect is a lady beetle. And we know the lady beetles are beneficial. They eat a ton of aphids, both as adult insects as well as larval insects. Now, um, speaking of lady beetles, there are a ton of different species of them out there. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the different species. Um, some of these are native species. Some of them are introduced species. Um, some of the introduced species, unfortunately, become problematic, and we'll see that here in a second. There are lots of predators out there. Again, larval stages. Um, this is a typical lady beetle larva here. And as a larva, they can clean up populations of aphids and scale insects, sometimes better than the adults. As I mentioned earlier, they're stuck there. Until they get their wings as an adult, they're not going to go anywhere. So they are going to very, very thoroughly search whatever plants that they are on to find whatever um, resources they can to consume. Unfortunately, sometimes it is other lady beetles that they will eat of different species. But they really clean up a lot of aphids. Um, and here's a, another species of lady beetle, so they don't all look the same. Um, this one is very, very common in agricultural fields. Um, and that picture is a little more orangey than typical. They tend to be pink in color. Um, this is Coleomeglia maculata. That is a mouthful. Um, so we call it for short, C-Mac, or the cornfield lady beetle. 
They are very common in cornfields and soybean fields. I can guarantee you I find them every year in both of those types of environments from very early in the spring till very late in the season. So they are a season-long beneficial insect around our agricultural fields. Again, going back to the larval stages, um, there's one larva eating another larva. So again, they are opportunistic. If there's not enough aphids around, they will start eating each other to make sure some of them make it to the adult stage. Uh, and they are kind of a bizarre looking insect. That one happens to be the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And this is the one that a lot of people say, oh, it's that insect that looks like a lady beetle, but it's not. But it is, um, and it is a tremendous predator out there. Um, and even when they first hatch out of their egg masses, um, they tend to be mostly black in color. Uh, it's not until they get a little bigger that you start seeing that orange and black motif associated with them. Some of the other species use camouflage to hide amongst their prey. Here's one that has waxy secretions all over its back to um, allow it to move amongst its, amongst its prey without detection. The pupal stage is usually on the host plants where they have been feeding all the, all the, the time as a larva. And so these funny looking hunchbacked type of objects that are stuck to the leaves are the lady beetle pupae. And you gotta recognize them for what they are, otherwise you might suspect that they're something dangerous to the plants. Uh, here's a couple of examples of them. Um, here's some of the larvae that are preparing to go into that pupal stage, and you, you can see that's kind of on a cabbage leaf there. You see some cabbage aphids around them, so that's what they were taking advantage of. Again, reminding complete metamorphic, they start out as eggs, they hatch into larvae, the larvae pupate, and eventually become the adult insect. Uh, and that's the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And you can, can see why it's called multicolored. It has a range of color to it. It has a range of spotting pattern to it. And yet that's all the same species. And this is the one that was imported intentionally uh, and introduced into orchards. It's a fantastic predator. It will decimate populations of aphids. And when we got this soybean aphid introduced into the United States, these ladies love them. And they will explode in populations in soybean fields whenever the soybean aphid is present in those fields. Many times they will suppress those soybean aphid populations if they're not disturbed by an insecticide application. When they reach those high populations in those soybean aphid infested fields, um, they do become problematic afterwards. Uh, again, just a couple more different types of lady beetles. Some of them don't look like lady beetles at all, like the twice stabbed lady beetle here. Um, and some of them are incredibly tiny because they specialize on mites rather than on other insects. And so this little strepsis, no, uh, Stepthoris um, type of predator is really tiny. You'd almost have to have a magnifying glass to see it. That's what the adult looks like. And that could very easily be confused with a flea beetle if you don't know what the uh, different species are. Um, very quickly with pollinators, um, a lot of different, uh, well, the pollinators, the honeybees get most of the attention there, but there are a multitude of other pollinators there. But the other hymenoptera, things like the yellow jackets, the bald-faced hornets, the paper wasps, uh, the mud dauber wasps, now these are not pollinators. They do very little as far as pollination of plants, but their main role when it comes to being beneficial, and, it, and when we look at the wasps, we sometimes think, wasps, beneficial? Yeah, um, they are actually very beneficial until they sting you, uh, but um, they, can, they are predators. Through the vast majority of the growing season, they are voracious predators. 
they eat caterpillars, they eat flies, they eat maggots, they, well, they'll even visit carrion and eat the flesh off of a dead animal. Um, so um, they are beneficial and they can wipe out populations of caterpillars. Um, this one here is eating one of the black cutworms, uh, but they will utilize any caterpillar species that they find as food for themselves, as well as food for feeding their offspring as they're growing. That includes the yellow jacket. The yellow jacket is a major, major predator. Um, even though we don't think of them that way, they are. Now, we usually start getting concerned about the yellow jackets around uh, fair times or street festival times or fall harvest festival times because they, um, they have that little switch in their mind that when winter is approaching, they think they need to carve up to survive the winter. Uh, well, that's a genetic throwback to when the entire colony survived winter in their past history. Um, most of our yellow jacket and paper wasp colonies will die with the first major frost. And the only members of the colony that survive to the following year are the mated queens. Uh, but the workers of the colony just don't know that. Um, but they still have ingrained in their genetics that they have to carve up to prepare for overwintering. And that brings them into co a conflict with us when they're after sweets. And all of those uh, fall festivals, fairs, etc., there's a lot of sweet material that bring them into those areas and conflict with, with us. We can't forget the spiders. Spiders. All spiders are predators. All spiders require um, insects to feed on to su survive, to grow, and to develop. Um, a lot of people don't like spiders. They have a fear of spiders, and they just don't realize how much of an ally they are to us. And there are a multitude of spiders out there. They all have fangs. They all have venom. They use that venom to suppress their prey so that they can consume them. But very, very few spiders are actually of any medical importance. It's only a couple species. So most of these spiders are actually fantastic allies to us in terms of eating insect populations. Things like the wolf spiders, they travel around a lot looking for prey to consume. Um, there are crab spiders that are ambushers that sit on plants waiting for insects to come into the plants. We already talked about the, the wolf spiders, jumping spiders. Now, little salticids, these are, are actually very interesting little spiders that jump on their prey to capture their prey. Um, now, if you put up fence posts for signage for um, uh, different cultivars and hybrids of plants that you put into your agricultural field, when you go, down, uh, go to take those signs down, you will find these spiders hiding behind those signs. They love fence posts. Um, but uh, they're a very good predator around fields. Some of them are more oriented toward woodlots and places like that, such as the arrow-shaped microthena. These are the orb-spinning spiders. Uh, and the black and yellow garden spider and the striped garden spider are, are huge predators around agricultural fields. Again, they are our allies in managing insect populations. There's a crab spider that has captured, unfortunately, a ground beetle. So again, even the spiders aren't selective as to what they will utilize. Not all mites are bad mites. You know, two-spotted spider mite and soybeans, mm, nobody wants those. But there are also predaceous mite species out there that specialize on the two-spotted spider mite. And under the right conditions, those predatory mites will keep those two-spotted spider mite populations in check. Uh, so there are tiny creatures out there that are helping us out. Um, again, uh, that's the spine soldier bug uh, consuming a Mexican bean beetle. We don't have me many Mexican bean beetles in our area here in northwest Ohio, but go down south in Ohio, go on into the eastern part of Ohio, and it's a much more common type of insect, and there are definitely insects that feed on them. Uh, there's a, um, a spine soldier bug feeding on a potato beetle larva. 
Uh, so they will utilize all kinds of larvae. Some of the other true bugs, there's the big-eyed bug and there's a damsel bug. Um, damsel bugs are incredibly common in alfalfa fields. Um, they are a major predator set in alfalfa fields as long as they don't get killed by an insecticide treatment. Uh, there's an assassin bug feeding on a caterpillar. Um, so there's lots of different true bugs out there that feed on other insects. Um, there's uh, another s example of the spine soldier bug there on the right-hand side eating soft flies off of a shrub. Um, there's a tiny, tiny true bug there called the minute pirate bug. The minute pirate bug, I find tons of them in soybean fields. And so they're a major ally in soybean fields. Uh, here you can see the pest species over there on the left-hand side of the image. That's a, called a lace bug. Not a lace wing, but a lace bug. And they, you notice the pattern. They all seem to be moving away from that much tinier predator. It is a voracious little predator. And unfortunately, this can be a a bit of a nuisance in the fall. Now, when soybean fields are being harvested in the fall, these minute pirate bugs will fly away from those soybean fields, and frequently they end up landing on people. And just like some of the other predators, they will taste you to see if you're something good to eat. And so I get a lot of complaints about minute pirate bugs in the fall when soybean fields are being harvested. Um, and um, they end up dispersing frequently into urban environments and calls coming in about these tiny little insects that keep on uh, pricking people. And, and it's a kind of a powerful, stingy feeling when you get tasted by this little insect. It has a, an amazing tact at hitting a nerve end when it sinks its little mouth parts into your skin. Now, one of the interesting things to me as an entomologist, and maybe I'm just a little weird, I can identify this insect even after you smash it. Now that response of when you get bitten is you slap and, and slide and, and try to um, ease the pain a little bit. When you kill this insect, it gives off a very distinct odor. And it, it's a very, to me, it's a very identifiable odor. So I don't even have to see this insect to know what has bitten me. Because when you smash, it will give off this scent. It's a very aromatic type of scent. Uh, and so I can uh, identify it with, even from a smashed specimen. But it is our ally. We've already looked at the green lacewing eggs, and there's more than just the green lacewings out there. Uh, we saw the larvae. There's another species. Uh, there's a third species. Um, they're tremendous aphid predators. Um, they are also caterpillar predators, so things like green clover worms they will utilize quite frequently, both in soybean and alfalfa. And some of them use camouflage to protect themselves from predation themselves and to hide from others. So you could see on the left-hand side, that one's using lichens to protect itself. On the uh, one on the right-hand side, it's using fluff off the back of a leaf to hide itself from being preyed upon itself. There's the pupal stage. They pupate right on the host plants where they've been feeding. They spin a silk cocoon, and inside there, they go through metamorphosis to become the adult insect. Um, the green lacewing is probably the one that's most recognizable, uh, but there are several other species out there. There's a brown lacewing. There's a dusty uh, lacewing. Or, you know, lacewing. Um, so there's a multitude of species of them out there. I usually see them at my porch light around the door um, of my home. Uh, I you know, have dogs that I hang out the door that allow them to, to go to the bathroom. And while they're out there, I'm looking at what's hanging around my porch light so I can see what's available at the time. Um, here's an interesting one. What's that look like to you? Does that look like anything to you on the screen? Now, it's not a lightning bug, but a good guess. Um, that's actually a maggot. That is one of those dry maggots that lives on the surfaces of leaves. 
Um, and there's several different species of them out there, and they are voracious aphid predators as well. So here you can see one in amongst a, an aphid colony, uh, and uh, they grab them and they devour them uh, with their mouth hooks that they have inside of their, their mouth area. Uh, and they eat a lot of aphids, and this is the adult insect, the hoverfly or that surfid fly, the one, it's a bee mimic, and a lot of people confuse them for sweat bees. Um, so there's one example, there's another example, there's a third example. Um, there's a multitude of species of these hoverflies out there, and some of them are pretty sizable. This one here was the size of a yellow jacket. In fact, when I first saw this, I thought it was a yellow jacket until I got a little closer and observed how it was flying. So these are tremendous allies for, out, for us out there, these hoverflies, and not necessarily as the adult insect, but as the larval stage. The larvae consume tons of aphids. Um, so it's an interesting ally, and we saw this image before. Um, the, this is a midge species. Uh, midges are a type of fly, and in amongst those aphids there on the right-hand side, you see a bit of an orange streak. That's the maggot of that midge species. So there's a lot of flies that are predators of aphids. Um, the, here's a, a different type of predator. It snatches all kinds of plant hoppers and tree hoppers to consume them. It has a type of mouth part where it can impale the, the prey. And then, uh, I really love this one, it's called a, a robber fly, and it's a big insect, uh, and it preys on all kinds of other insect species. And so this one is a, at least an inch in length, up to an inch and a quarter in length. It's a monster flying out there. And there's several species of robber flies. This is usually the way I find them because they're in the middle of copulation. They don't fly nearly as efficiently, so I can track them down pretty quickly. Um, here's a, a, an even more curious opportunity. There's three robber flies there. Two of them are male, one of them is female. So the two males are competing for the female. The female, even though she's being copulated, really isn't interested in what the males are doing because if you look over here at the left-hand side of that image, you'll see that she's feeding on a, a squash bug. Um, so she's busy feeding. She's not really caring what the males are doing, and there's two males trying to uh, mate her at the same time. So nature can be really bizarre at times whenever you have that opportunity to catch one. What is that? Anybody recognize that? What is that? No guess? What's it look like? What? It looks like a bee. It looks like a bumblebee. When it, in fact, it is a fly. This is a bee mimic. Uh, and it's a fly. How can you tell a, a fly from a bee? One set of wings on a true fly. Absolutely. Um, a non-fly always has two pairs of wings. This only has one pair of wings. So this is a predator, and unfortunately, they are non-selective. The prey that it has snatched here is a tiger beetle, and tiger beetles are predaceous beetles, and it just happened to be in the wrong place, and this uh, robber fly managed to snatch it and kill it. And I, uh, the bizarre thing is I was standing here when this happened, um, I was walking through the woodlot and these uh, uh, six spotted tiger beetles run all over the trail in the woodlot and they were jumping up in front of me and as one jumped up the fly, this robber fly came in and I literally heard a snap whenever it, it grabbed that beetle and sunk its mouth parts into the back of, the, of that tiger beetle. Now uh, here's one called the hanging robber fly. And you notice in its feet, it has a metallic bee, which is actually a beneficial insect. And it captured it on the wing, and as it uh, sat there, and I was taking pictures of it, it sunk its mouth parts into that bee to begin eating it. Uh, but it's still a predator, non-selective predator. It is a predator.
Um, tiger, or the ground beetles, as I mentioned before, both as adults and as larvae, are predaceous types of insects, consume a lot of ground-dwelling types of insects. And there's a whole slew of different types of ground beetles out there. So you can see some of the diversity in the appearance of them. Some of them have red colors. Some of them are actually very fluorescent in color. The one there on the right-hand side, that is called the fiery searcher. It's a huge caterpillar um, uh, feeding beetle. And the adult there is a good inch and a quarter in length. It's a massive beetle with massive mandibles. So um, this is one, if you ever see one, be careful if you think you're gonna handle it because it will use those massive mandibles to bite you as well. Now, but again, the, the ground beetles, all, most of the species of ground beetles are our ally. Um, there are a couple of extension, exceptions, such as the um, corn seed beetle. The corn seed beetle, which is one of the early spring beetles that can damage our corn crop, um, is a ground beetle. But, and it just happens to feed on corn seed. Uh, but the vast majority of the other ground beetles are beneficial types of insects. And here's a couple of them that specialize on slugs and snails. And so if you have issues with slugs and snails in cover cropped fields uh, or high residue fields, you want these uh, two particular beetles around because they will help to suppress your slug populations. Some of the other diverse organisms out there, centipedes. All centipedes are predators. They are all built for consuming other insects. So the centipedes are our allies and they are built for speed. Um, they have one pair of legs per body segment. Um, and that first pair of legs has been modified into fangs with venom associated with them. So they can give a powerful, painful bite if they are mismanaged. And then finally, the parasites and the parasitoids. These are the insects that lay their eggs on or in other insects and their larvae then feed on the insect for their growth and development. This is where nature really gets bizarre. Um, and if you're a sci-fi um, enthusiast, one of the films called Alien, who's seen Al Alien as a movie? Um, when you start really thinking about the alien, the aliens in that egg pod and the, the um, unfortunate astronaut comes along and looks at the egg pod and the, the larva hatches out of that egg pod and sh shoves it into the throat of the astronaut and lays something inside of the astronaut. Well, then they, the organism starts developing inside of the guy and um, the guy's feeling lethargic and not so good. And, one day he's starting to feel better and while he's sitting there at the dining table, what emerges out of his gut but the alien. And then it goes scampering off somewhere and it pupates someplace and then it becomes the adult alien. That's an insect through and through, a, predator, a parasitoid type of insect. Same thing, most sci-fi writers are frustrated entomologists. So here you see some aphids on the back of a leaf here, and those little brown balloons are parasitized aphids. There was an, a small insect that laid its, insect, its egg inside of that aphid. Notice the one there in the middle of that slide that has this hatch that's open. That's where a parasitoid emerged out of the back of that aphid. Um, and here's one that emerged through the bottom of it <clears throat> and basically silked the aphid to the leaf there. And there's the wasp that laid its egg inside of that aphid that developed its offspring in the aphid. Tiny, tiny, tiny little wasps. And you really have to be searching for them to find them. I'm sure you've all seen this scenario before. What's going on in this scenario here? Are the... Well, the, the hornworm, are those eggs on it? 
No, those aren't the egg stage. The eggs were laid inside of the caterpillar. These are the pupal stages after the larva has consumed the caterpillar on the inside. There's the adult wasp laying its eggs into the hornworm caterpillar. There's the mature larvae as they have reemerged out of the skin of the caterpillar. And then they pupate on the outside. And from those pupae, the next generation of wasps emerge. Um, you know, a very elaborate life cycle, and you have to be aware of what's going on there. Uh, here's cutworm with a parasitoid that's on the outside of the caterpillar. Here's a caterpillar. The caterpillar there on the top of the image is already dead, and all those cocoons on the leaf surface are the parasitoids that um, have emerged from it. And then the other caterpillar on the lower side, that was from a wasp that laid one egg inside of that caterpillar, and then that egg divided and divided and divided to the point that there's over 100 new wasp larvae growing in that caterpillar. So these parasitic wasps are, are tremendous allies. Some of them are incredibly tiny. Unfortunately, the pointer doesn't point very well on these screens. But over there on the right-hand side is a tiny wasp that laid its egg in these scale insects. And there are also tiny wasps that lay their eggs in other insects' eggs. And so there's a wasp on uh, an egg of a, an additional insect. So there's all kinds of allies out there. We have to be careful with what we're doing out there that we don't destroy these allies. And with that, I will draw this presentation to an end. Any quick questions? Yes. Um, so issues of earthworms and slugs, uh, where the earthworms are down, um, they may be completely unrelated situations. Um, uh, slugs obviously require a moist habitat, and the more moisture available, the more slugs you're going to get. Now, what's happened with the earthworms, as long as you have been applying any kind of chemical that could damage the earthworms, if something else is happening there to reduce the, reduce the earthworm population. Uh, and I can't tell you what that is right off the top of my head. One more question. There's a, uh, um, mm -hmm. there's a Xerxes Society, and that's Xerxes, that's a capital X, um, and I can get that information to you later. But yeah, the Xerxes Society um, has all kinds of plant recommendations. And they they have websites that you can uh, and visit and get that information, as well as um, there's a bee lab over in Worcester, and they also include these suggested pollinating plants. <laughs>